The good, the bad, and the ugly. Norwegian Breakaway 2023 Caribbean Cruise. So several years ago, we'd booked a Norwegian cruise. Then COVID hit and everything got canceled. I've been on several other cruise lines, never Norwegian, so I was excited about taking this slightly more upscale ship than your average carnival line. Unfortunately, that got put on hold for a few years until recently when it looked like we'd finally get back to doing the cruise. So, this is my video on the experience. What's cruising like now? Are we close to being back to normal? Are there still COVID concerns? How are the ports and other areas after being shut down for so long? Does the food and entertainment and other features live up to the hype? I will share with you my thoughts. Before we went on this cruise, we did a lot of what people do. We searched for reviews and tips about cruising, especially related to this new ship in line we were trying. There's no shortage of uh, cruise YouTube channels, but I think most of them just tell you basic stuff. They're rarely very critical because many of these people base their living on cruising all the time, and they don't want to piss off any of the companies. I can see that. I'm going to give my honest, unadulterated opinion on what the experience was like. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And there was definitely some unpleasantness on the trip. Some of these things might be subjective or circumstantial, but others are clear problems the cruise line really needs to address. So, let's get into it. First and foremost, opinions are subjective. What I find appealing, you might not, and vice versa. The ship in question we were on left from the port of New Orleans, my hometown. Now, this is a very sophisticated food town, which means your average local really does know the difference between good and average food. There may be some people who are on this ship that don't care whether a steak is medium rare or well done, or think an omelet is gourmet food. They may have had no problems with the restaurants. Different strokes for different folks. But in the course of this video, I'll also talk about issues with the service that I think anybody can relate to, regardless of how sophisticated their tastes are. After being off for the boat for a few days, I kept asking myself, would you go again? Which, when I was on the boat, my answer was, I don't think so. After going over pictures and videos of the experience, which I'll share here with you, I'm reminded there were a lot of good things. So is it worth the money? That's the more appropriate question, I think. But watch to the end, and I will give you the complete answer to this and other questions. First off, we paid over $3,000 for a room with a balcony, double occupancy. Nothing super fancy, but definitely an above average setup. And this is the first time I've cruised on a ship with a balcony room. And I have to say, it will be hard to go back to a room without a balcony. Even though it was cramped, it was cozy. And I really looked forward to being able to come back to the room after being all over the place during the day and take my shoes off and then open that balcony and see the ocean. It was just a really nice thing. I really had no problems with the room except for one thing, and this little issue is indicative of a string of other weird things that are built into the design of the ship that may frustrate people. But before I get into the room, let's talk about embarkation. The whole process of getting on and off the ship is largely unavoidably painful, I know, but I will still complain about it. The terminal was ill-equipped to properly handle the people. It was stuffy and uncomfortable as we queued up in these huge lines that snaked all over the place. You never really knew how long the line was because of that. Which begs the question, how many people were on this ship? Well, over 4,400 guests with over 1,600 crew members. That's 6,000 plus people on this boat. It was a big boat. Definitely the biggest one I'd ever been on. I'll be doing another video possibly showing behind the scenes of the boat because that was an interesting experience that only 16 of the 4,400 plus guests were able to do. So that's something uh, you want to stay tuned for. Knowing what I now know about the logistics that happen on embarkation day, it's really amazing this gets pulled off. In less than half a day, the entire guest complement of the ship leaves and another 4,400 people get on. We've got one of the early embarkation assignments of about 1.30 p.m. and it took about an hour or more to finally get on the ship. I suspect people who arrived later had to wait even longer. When we got on board, our room was not ready. It was still dirty. Many people complained about that. I understand logistically this is a challenge, and I wasn't that bothered myself. We didn't have our bags yet, so we walked around the ship while we waited for the room to be ready and our bags to arrive. The first problem to appear was my suitcase. Everything else showed up but mine. I suspected the reason for this was because I had wine in my suitcase. And this is the first example of an annoying problem that seems to be the result of Norwegians' inconsistent policies. On one part of their website, it says, no alcohol can be brought on board. But if you look elsewhere, it says you are allowed to bring wine and champagne, but they will charge you a corkage fee of $15 per bottle. But if you have a drink package, the corkage fee is waived. All these tidbits are sometimes in different locations on the site, making it hard to tell if one policy superseded another. So I had the drink package, so I wasn't worried about the corkage fees. 
but the end result was my suitcase disappeared. It took me several hours to find it got stuck in limbo, probably because of the wine. But they also saw I had the beverage package and just coughed up my bags with no corkage fee. I still think they have to work this out. If your bag disappears, they should at least tell you how and why. So let's talk about the room. That's the first thing. I thought it was really nice. I love the balcony. Our bed was supposed to be a queen, but what that ultimately means is two twin beds are pushed together and you can feel the scene. My partner didn't like that there weren't fitted sheets on the bed and they would come off the mattress. I can see why they aren't using them after getting a look at how the laundry is done on the ship. It's just not efficient to have both fitted and flat sheets, so they use only flat sheets. Wasn't a big deal to me, but to some they might not like that. The quality of the bedding was very good. The room was nice and comfortable. There's a little fridge in each room filled with three drinks that if you touch, you'll get charged for. One of the weird issues we had with our room pertained to the air conditioner. We were told there might be some tricks to making it work, and there were. And it took us quite a while to kind of figure it out. Sometimes when you turned it on, it worked. Sometimes it didn't. We didn't know if the operations had restricted when AC can be turned on or what. There's no actual details, just a thermostat that sometimes seemed to work and sometimes didn't. We tried different techniques we heard from people on how to make it work. Somebody said, oh, you got to make sure your cabin door is locked and in the down position. But that didn't work. Eventually, I figured it out. If you have the sliding glass door to your balcony open, the AC won't come on. So you have to close the doors to get the AC to come on. Now, this might seem like common sense, but if you have a balcony door, keeping the door open a little bit lets you hear the wonderful sound of the waves and the water, which is a great sound to fall asleep to. But if you do that, then you get no AC. It was frustrating. Okay, so we're on the boat. Let's go look around. Before I get to some of the more critical things, let me talk about some of the really nice things about the Norwegian Breakaway. It's a really lovely ship. The attention to detail with interior design is absolutely magnificent. We walked all over the boat, and I shot video of many different areas, many of which you'll see throughout this video, and it was very impressive. The woodwork, the chandeliers, the flooring, the lighting, the tile, the wall treatments, even little bits and pieces of the signage. Everything was done really, really with a nice attention to detail. Norwegian obviously spent a lot of money making the ship look gorgeous, and it shows. Each of the different dining areas had entirely different designs, and architecturally, it was stunning. The -the over-the-top attention to interior design made me really excited to try the other amenities like food and shows. If they were of the same quality, we were in for a treat. Unfortunately, that level of quality was inconsistent. The ship is broken into decks, obviously, with the lowest ones being reserved for the crew and production, and the upper ones for guests and amenities. Most of the main accessible public areas begin around deck 6 to deck 8, with 9 through 14 being more for cabins, and decks 15 plus for outside areas and the buffet, which is at deck 15. I won't go into every single featured location on the ship, because the video would be too long, but there is a lot here. Although, by half the week, we'd basically seen almost everything. As big as the ship is, it's not like there are a ton of hidden places to discover. There are definitely some, though, and we'll talk about the areas we enjoyed the most. One area that was one of our favorites was called the Waterfront. This is basically a balcony that wraps around the ship on mid-deck that had a variety of features, from comfortable lounge chairs where you can read and sun, to high tops outside some of the bars, to little patios you can dine on adjacent to some of the restaurants, to things like shuffleboard and giant chess pieces. It was generally a pretty quiet area of the ship, far away from the swimming pool and buffet, a great place for a little tranquility. Now, I need to preface things with the fact that we were one couple on board with several other cabins of friends, some of whom had children and some didn't. I can't speak to the experience of bringing children on board, but I can say there's plenty for them to do. If you have kids, this boat has a lot to offer. If you're looking for a cruise where there aren't a lot of kids running around, this may not be the right boat. We went during Mardi Gras while school was still in session and there weren't a ton of young children on board. There is also an area of the ship that is designated adults only, a section at one end with pools and hot tubs. Probably the single most popular place on the ship, aside from the main pool area, is the buffet. It's situated way up top on deck 15 aft. It takes up a large area and opens onto the main pool in the center of the ship. So Deck 15 is always bustling with activity, whether it's people camped out on the pool loungers sipping fruity drinks or in line at the buffet further down. There's always a lot going on there. And during peak times, it can be difficult to find a place to sit down. So here we are having breakfast up on the upper deck because there's actually no tables in the buffet and uh, the pay diners, the pay areas, are um, 
plenty of nice tables, but they're blocked up because you can't use those right now. So we're eating on some, some lawn chairs. I found the best thing to do was try to coordinate hitting the buffet during off times. It's continually refreshed throughout the day, so you aren't running into stale food by going at 2, 3 p.m. instead of noon. They do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The breakfast seems to run right into lunch, so if you come at 11 a.m. hoping to get some non-breakfast food, you might have to wait. Generally speaking, the buffet was great. This was the first place we checked out on the boat while waiting for our room and luggage. We got on board early enough to find a nice seat and enjoy some food while everybody else was checking in. I myself love buffets, my partner not so much, but I think we both found plenty of things we liked at the buffet. How does it rate? I'd say on par with a casino buffet. Lots of choices, decent quality food, good service, but nothing gourmet as expected. There wasn't much that stood out as outstanding at the buffet, although I will say their french fries and fried hash brown potatoes were really good. I suspected they fry that stuff in beef tallow, although I actually asked one chef and he said vegetable oil. I'll be honest, I don't think it was vegetable oil. It reminded me of old school McDonald's fries before they switched to vegetable oil. It was notably good, which is really ironic that one of the best things at a buffet would be the French fries. I know that's crazy, but I'm not lying. They were great, which didn't bode well for my desire to eat more healthy, unfortunately. So what was at the buffet? I tried to document this. I may do a separate video just showing the buffet so people get an idea of what to expect. When I watched videos, there was not a lot of information specific of here's what you get, and I really wanted to show what it was like and what's there. So the buffet is pretty basic with standard hamburgers, hot dogs, lots of condiments, some nice ones like sauerkraut, and sauteed onions and mushrooms. They had both a standard salad bar as well as various specialty salad stations where you could get a salad made to order with say chicken or steak and blue cheese. Definitely a notch above normal. Likewise, at breakfast, you could get the standard fare of scrambled eggs, corned beef hash, sausage links, bacon, biscuits, gravy, French toast, waffles, but noticeably absent were grits, and a large variety of fruits. But there also was an omelet station where you could have something made to order. With as many people as there were on the ship, and just a few of those custom stations, you had to time it well to be able to get something from them without waiting too long. But there were lots of options, so I don't think anybody was ever left hungry. The dinner buffet featured standard fare like prime rib, turkey, chicken, Salisbury steak, and other things. The menu was not super adventurous, but every once in a while you'd see something that was unusual. And it did change slightly from day to day, but I'd say at least 60 to 70% of the buffet was consistently the same throughout the trip. But there was enough that changed that made you want to constantly check. And also, sometimes it would be something that would pop up that would only be in one little part of the buffet. So it wasn't a bad idea sometimes to do a full 360 because there was two complete kitchens that typically mirrored each other, but sometimes there would be a station that was unique to just that one side. You had to kind of scope around, and I kind of like that. I like the hunt of it, you know. Noticeably nice was the inclusion of a very nice selection of Indian food, even better than when they occasionally featured Asian dishes. But if you were looking for premium items like nice-sized shrimp or good cuts of beef, they were hard to find. They weren't impossible, but they only popped up here and there. The nicest shrimp I saw were in a sweet and sour shrimp dish. The last day I did see beef tenderloin at the buffet, but it was all a bit overcooked. There's definitely a lot of economic optimizing going on when it comes to food service, and I'll talk a lot more about that. One of the things I would tell somebody going on this cruise that I wish I had known earlier is that don't be afraid to ask for something special or particular. In a general sense, most of the service on the ship was superlative, and people went out of their way to be accommodating. This didn't work out so well in the formal dining areas, but I think it would work out better at the buffet. And I, I know that sounds ironic, right? Asking for something specific. But I, I do think the buffet people might actually be able to deliver faster than the people in the formal dining room. Ultimately, our best, most consistent dining experiences were probably at the buffet. And this says a lot when such a huge portion of the real estate on the cruise ship is dedicated to fancy dining. We'll get into that. This is an area where Norwegian really drops the ball, and I hope they can get it fixed. Obviously, the standard MO for cruise ships is to get you on board with a modest price and then upsell you as much as possible. Norwegian has many of the standard upselling schemes you've seen on other cruise lines. Picture taking, jewelry, art auctions, pay to play games, the casino, and lots of duty free stores that don't really save you as much as you think. But Norwegian is different from other cruise lines in that they've gone all in on upselling people higher quality food. Now this is new to me. There are more than a few really nice restaurants on the ship that are simply not available to standard guests by default. You can pay a la carte for these restaurants or you can buy special cruise packages that may give you some specialty dining complimentary. It all depends on what packages you have. 
And this is the beginning of where a cruise experience can get a bit annoying. There are places you can and cannot go depending upon who you are. And this is a reflection of how much money you've spent. At the upper tier are those staying at what's called the Haven. It's basically a private area of the ship exclusively for people who pay a premium, more than twice the cost of a standard balcony room. But they also have their own private pool, private restaurant, private elevator, and even butlers. It's like an elite social class on the ship, and you'll see little indications of it here and there that these first class people exist. There are also a bunch of specialty dining places. There's a Brazilian steakhouse, a standard steakhouse, an Italian place, a French place, a gelato bar, an ice cream bar, a bake shop, a hibachi restaurant, a raw bar, a sushi bar, and an upscale seafood restaurant and an upscale burger place, all of which cost extra. A massive amount of the ship's real estate has been dedicated to enticing you to pay more for premium food. This was new to me, like paying a cover charge to enter a shopping mall. And I think it was one of the things that put me off the most. We had a package that gave us a chance to dine at two specialty places. We did the Brazilian Steakhouse and the Hibachi Place. Of the two, the Brazilian Steakhouse to me was the best and probably the best single dining experience on the boat. But it also had some problems. Apparently, the seafood place, Ocean Blue, is the hot one, the one to get, but it was booked full the moment we got on the boat. We tried to book it even before we got on the boat and we couldn't. So this indicates another issue I'll address in a bit. At one point, I had a craving for some sushi, but there was no way I was going to pay $14 for a California roll, and that's what it cost at their sushi place. As I mentioned before, the look of all these places are gorgeous. Every restaurant was beautifully decorated. The staff was very attentive. The biggest problem was the food expedition. It simply was pretty lousy at every place we ate. Granted, in some cases we were in a fairly large group, but we didn't expect to all be immediately served at the same time, and it certainly didn't look like there was any attempt even to do so. We often had to wait beyond our appointment time to be seated, and this is with having reservations well in advance. I'll talk about the food, but one thing that made the dining experience much less appealing were how long we had to wait, and we chose late dining when things weren't busy and we still had to wait. That being said, the salad condiment bar at the Brazilian Steakhouse was amazing. I wish I could have just dined at that bar. I think it was between 50 and 60 bucks per person normally to eat there. Like most Brazilian steakhouses, you're invited to first gorge yourself on the salad bar before waiters bring around the food on skewers, offering them to guests. They give you a coaster with one side red and one side green to signal if you want more food or to stop. Everybody's was green most of the night waiting for food to arrive. The service was pretty slow, and as expected, they bring the lower value cuts of meat first. Everybody tried to hold out for the tenderloin, but it took so long for tidbits of food to show up. By the time they offered us premium meat, many people were full, and the tenderloin was all overcooked. This became a somewhat consistent theme regarding premium foods. We wondered if it was by design. Serve everybody well-done filet so they won't ask for any more? Who knows? But calls for more rare cuts didn't really produce anything. That being said, this was the most hearty and most satisfying meal on the ship, in my opinion. It was also a decent value when you factor in the quality of the salad bar, which is a shame that it was only available in one part of the ship that cost extra. As I write this, I'm now reminded of why I was having a tarnished opinion of being on the boat and how I forgot once I got off. There's a constant feeling, at least twice a day when you want to eat, that you're unable to have as good an experience as you'd like unless you open up your wallet in a big way. And I'm just not used to that in terms of dining on a cruise ship. And on the breakaway, it's ever-present. And this underlines the fact that most of what I disliked about the cruise ship was by design and not the result of any employees not performing well. The other specialty dining we tried was Tepanaki the hibachi place another premium option and this one we had to wait a very long time they screwed up our reservation somehow which became a recurring theme which will tie into one of the biggest complaints we had about the trip this was a standard hibachi place nothing special fried rice steak shrimp scallops chicken squid the shrimp and scallops were nice sized everything else was okay the squid was really skimpy this being a premium restaurant, we expected more skilled cooks, but these guys were basically newbies at the hibachi. And hearing them sing, we will rock you in bad English while banging their utensils on various parts of the stove, it didn't do anything for me. Even the kids in our group were unimpressed. It was cringy at best. At the end of the night, I was just glad to get out of there. So my two specialty dining experiences were a base hit and a complete strikeout. But hey, what about complimentary formal dining areas? Let's talk about them. They can't be too bad, right? Right? So, a huge area of the ship is dedicated to these formal dining rooms. There are three main ones. 
two called Taste and Savor that are on one deck opposite each other. Again, very beautifully decorated with a nice bar in the middle between them. And then there's a larger one called the Manhattan Room, which is on another deck at the aft of the ship. It boasts a stage where artists perform while you're eating, almost like a lounge dinner theater. It's made up in a beautiful Art Deco style. This section of the ship is also constantly vibrating from the engine. It didn't bother me, but I'm sure it bothered a lot of other people as everything occasionally was vibrating. Um, But it had great views. Over the course of the cruise, we ate at all three of these places, and our experience was basically the same. The food was really disappointing. They all basically shared the same menu, as far as I could tell, with some portions changing from day to day, but the choices were lackluster at best. Fried fish, chicken with pasta, sirloin tips, etc. More like what you'd find in an upscale cafeteria. Sometimes the presentation was good, sometimes not. Sometimes the food was cold, sometimes it was undercooked, sometimes it was overcooked. Sometimes an Asian chicken salad would only have one tiny cube of chicken the size of a pencil eraser. I kid you not, it became a running joke. Could this meal be as bad as the last one? We stopped asking that question. After seeing some obviously behind-the-scenes stuff and realizing the kitchen for these places may not even be on the same deck, there are obviously some logistical issues here. Food is not getting out promptly. The quality control for the food is also inconsistent. The ingredients look to be good quality, but some of the prep leaves a lot to be desired. Very small cuts, inconsistent portion amounts, and lots and lots of stuff arriving room temperature. Basically, all the complimentary dining at this point sucked. As in, we all would have been better off heading up to the buffet. There were also some smaller complimentary places. There was O'Shean's Bar and Grill, a nice size area decorated like an Irish pub that served bar food. It was quite popular, but I didn't find anything on the menu that appealing. If I wanted bar food, I felt like I was better off going to the buffet and making my own burger and having as much fries as I wanted. The other place was Shanghai's Noodle Bar. I was excited about trying this place. Unfortunately, it was not open for lunch. And Not all the other formal dining places were necessarily open for times other than dinner, which represented a huge unused amount of space during much of the cruise. I didn't get it. The wait for the noodle bar was really long, and it didn't open until 5.30 p.m. Why not have that as a lunch option? But eventually we got in after an hour and a half wait. This was the last night of the cruise, so I went wild ordering a lot more than I would normally because I wanted to try everything, and they kept us waiting. So I tried two different noodle dishes in broth and two different pan-fried noodle dishes, as well as a few other items. Only one or two things on the menu I found good. The ingredients were all fresh, but the pan-fried noodle dishes all tasted the same, and they were overly sweet with some kind of dark plum sauce that overshadowed all the other more subtle tastes. The wet noodles were probably the best, but they were marred by a broth that lacked any flavor. That seemed to be a recurring theme on the boat when it came to soups. Every soup tasted weak and watered down. I had a French onion soup that tasted like one French onion soup split into three portions. The same thing applied to soups in the buffet. They seemed okay, but watered down. If they had simply put some chicken bouillon cubes in the broth, it would have been a thousand percent improvement. Another miss. So in short, probably the biggest disappointment of the cruise was the standard dining fare. It was just bad. Everybody in our group acknowledged it. The specialty dining is obviously better, but not by much. I would have loved to try some of the other spots, but just couldn't afford to plunk down so much more. So one of the big reasons why dining was frustrating, aside from the food and dispatch issues, was the general reservation system employed by Norwegian. This is a really serious problem they need to fix. You have multiple ways to reserve everything from show tickets to shore excursions to dining reservations. You can do so on the website before the cruise as well as later. You can talk to someone at a reservation desk on ship and try to reserve things. You can do so on Norwegian's mobile app, and you can also do some reservations on your room's TV system. The problem is, none of these systems seem to be well integrated with each other. On some platforms, there may be availability. On others, things are sold out. There's no easy way to cancel things, and and different systems may have things reserved differently. It was incredibly confusing. I have this feeling Norwegian's system is really screwed up, and half the time when they're looking at a screen trying to see if you're in the right place, there's nothing there, and they just nod and go, let me see what I can do, and then you wait. We did a lot of our planning even before we got on the boat well in advance but even then many options were sold out we tried to consolidate some reservations once on the boat and in some cases we could but most of the time we couldn't i have a feeling more could have been ironed out if we were willing to go down to deck six and stand in line for more than an hour at the understaffed guest services desk but that wasn't my idea of a vacation it looks like norwegian has long had a problem with guests complaining about their food i can see why and this is supposed to be the new and improved norwegian food I think they still need some work. 
if I were to go back, I'd probably skip all the complimentary formal dining and just either do the buffet or the specialty restaurants. So this turned out a lot longer than I thought. I may break this into several parts. I haven't even gotten to the shore excursions and other entertainment options on the ship. There's some good, fun stuff coming up, I promise. So stay tuned and watch the next part. And if you like this, please subscribe. It costs nothing. Just click subscribe, and you'll, you'll be notified of other interesting things that end up here. And I appreciate that. Thanks.